Public affairs programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years. Fight for funding. What's on the line for Davenport schools in what could be the most pivotal year for school financing in Iowa? And tapping into a neighborhood. What makes some of the areas where we live so special in the cities? A new initiative in the cities takes a look at our neighborhood, celebrating what's going well and where improvements can still be made. In a moment, we'll tell you how you can be involved. But first, Damport's ongoing challenge to the status quo in state education funding. Iowa lawmakers are giving schools in the state an increase in funding, but the 1% boost is half of what districts received last year and adds to concerns the state is not as committed to its schools as it once was. This unfolds as Davenport superintendent breaks the rules, spending reserve funds to avoid cuts, even though the state warned him not to, and the state's education department has launched an investigation. Joining us is the man at the center of the fight, Dr. Art Tate, superintendent of Davenport Schools. Thanks so much for joining us. Glad to be here. Well, let's start off, though, first with your trip to Des Moines. You and the Chamber of Commerce went last week. Students from the Davenport School District went this week. You really want the people in Des Moines to know that Davenport exists and that we've got problems. Oh, absolutely, and I went in between that. I went another time. You just have to keep the pressure on. Um, they've got a lot on their minds. But are the dynamics any different than they were last year? They are. It seems like we, we've really got some traction and people, I think this might be the year we actually see something moving on the equality issue. And let's talk about that right off the bat, of course, mm -hmm. because that's a, a, an issue that is, is putting your uh, license in jeopardy right now. What has been the reaction, at least from state lawmakers, and we'll talk about the state bureaucracy with the Education Department in a second, but as far as state lawmakers are concerned, that you think is different this year than last year? Because last year, all of this funding issue, all of your fight came down to the 11th hour and then just didn't succeed. Yeah. Well, three years ago was the first time that many of them had ever heard about it. We went up there and I took a little PowerPoint and, and they were surprised that there was even a difference. And so we didn't get much traction that year. And last year, there were some bills that came out. But this year, it seems like almost everyone understands there's an issue. I think they're getting more pressure from the home front because there's 163 districts that are getting less than the highest uh, districts in the state. So I think there's more people saying, hey, wait a minute. What about us? So I just feel like people, I got it now. Now, how do we fix it? Well, you put your career on the line right now. And the Denport School District has really put its uh, backing behind you on the line right now. You're saying some 160 other school districts, what are they doing? Sitting back and wait and see, or are you feeling some, some support from them as well? Well, they're supportive. I mean, they're supportive of the issue and they understand the moral imperative for equality. I mean, I can't ask other superintendents to do what I do. That's my decision and the board's decision. They've backed me 100% from the very beginning in March of 2014. Without them, I couldn't do this. They could just fire me for violating the law. And I want to point out that last week you did get unanimous, unanimous support from your board. What does that mean to you and, and what do you think that backing does for you going forward? Well, I think people know that I'm not a rogue superintendent. Um, I'm, I'm doing something which the state says is illegal, but the board says he's right. What he's doing is right. This is the best for our students and our community. Well, my understanding is that there, the board has only removed two school superintendents in Iowa over the last few years. One was for uh, uh, sexual misconduct. Another one had to do with, I think, some fiscal irregularities. To go after you for a point of... Um, uh, having to do with funding and, and you're trying to rally a point and make a supporting uh, argument for your position seems to go against pretty much what the laws are as far as the state of Iowa as far as removing a superintendent such as yourself. Well it's all subjective it goes before Very the so. Board of Educational Examiners and uh, I was referred by the Department of Education as having broken the law so perhaps he didn't have a choice I don't know but um, politics then, almost has to run its course right now, or at least the bureaucracy has to. I think the bureaucracy does. I mean, right now is in the investigatory stage, and I'm responding to an investigating officer. The, uh, my understanding is that the board, uh, the, the, res the result of this board's investigation is expected in mid-June. Um, any inkling what's going to happen before then, or, or we'll know shortly after you know? Well, the process is they investigate. There could be an administrative law judge that looks into it. It then goes before the BOEE. It's a very long 
uh, drawn out process. So I don't know the timing, but. It, it should take through at least the legislative session, I'm imagining. That's what I was going to get at, because between now and then, we will find out what the legislature is going to do, at least in theory. Yes. Let's talk about the budget that you are facing right now mm -hmm. and what the state of Iowa did. The governor wanting about a two, maybe a little more than 2%, uh, Democrats wanting in the area 4 to 5%, and then the legislature approving just over 1%. Governor signing it, a uh, 1% increase uh, in state funding for schools, but also hinting that if the finances of the state are better, more money could be freed up. You said earlier you weren't surprised by the 1% increase. Would you be surprised if more money were to be freed up? No, I wouldn't, because I heard him say that the other day to our students directly. And so I, I trust him. He's a man of his word. And, and I mean, budgets are budgets. Uh, we've got a difficult situation in Iowa. I understand that. I run a district budget. And sometimes I have to make cuts. And um, I trust that they're doing the best they can. In dollars and cents, the 1% difference in the increase means what to Davenport schools? I don't know exactly yeah. what that means um, in dollars and cents. Uh, that's not the way I figure it up. Um, we have built our budget on a 2% increase. That right. was the assumption. 1.1 is a little bit different. It doesn't uh, change my budget plan much. I have a three-year budget plan that's going to cut $18 million out in three years, and that's pretty tough. It's very tough. I know that you're planning on doing that without really getting rid of teachers as well, which is a major part of the budget. Uh, the uh, salaries make mm -hmm. up, what, about 70, 80 percent? 80 percent, of, yes. of a school district's yep. budget. So how is this possible that you can make such significant cuts? Early retirements, mm -hmm. and we have movement every year. So um, we are not going to fire anybody. We're not going to issue pink slips. Everybody will know by April where they're going to be next year. So people need stability, and I promised that from the very beginning. So again, because of early retirement, um, we don't have a problem. Teachers may have to move from when teaching one subject to another that they're certified in, but nobody will lose their job. What is interesting in the classroom, though, is that there may be more students in each of them. We're going to have to do that, and we've said at the high school and the uh, intermediate school, we might have to add a student or two. And we'll keep that as minimal as possible. And in the following years, we might have to do it to the elementary school. What is the average right now? Well, in elementary school, you start in kindergarten, it's 20. And it goes up to about 24 by the fifth grade. You might find 26 to 30 in intermediate, 28 to 30 in a high school mm -hmm. class. Some are much smaller in high school because of the variance in your subjects. The, the right. class size varies widely. But when you get started in education just a few years back, it was much lower number. Is education hurting because of that, or are we getting better teaching methods? In other words, is it as big of an impact as one might think? It is an impact. And again, I go back to behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a major issue that we deal with. And it depends on the students that you have. You could have 18 students and have a heck of a time any day. And you could have 30 great students and not have any problem. It's just the number of students. But a couple of students could make a difference. Getting back to budgeting one more time, and I know that the state was looking at a multi-year budget instead of just one year to do two years. That kind of fell by the wayside. That could have really helped education as far as planning is concerned, but lawmakers saying they don't, they don't know what the financial picture of Iowa is in two years, it'd be irresponsible to do that right now. I'm sure you would, like you said, you've got a three-year budget mm -hmm. plan. Uh, how, how difficult is it for Davenport schools to make budgeting decisions based on an annual budget from the state instead of uh, something longer lasting? We leave enough wiggle room, so we make assumptions. And whether I get, you know, the two-year people ask me, I said, it doesn't matter to me. I'd rather you be more accurate than early and just give me a two-year that maybe doesn't make sense or would change. And again, the governor said that's one of the things that he would like to see is, you know, look at the next revenue increase of the state or decrease and, and give us a realistic number. So I buy that. I go along with that. When you're looking at numbers too, you got to look at enrollment in Damport schools and we've been just seeing a decline over the years. A loss of about 3,000 students since 1991-92. That's a concern, but is there much you can do about that? And I know you've got partnerships with the city, so let's start with that. What are you trying to do to at least stop the decline of enrollment in Davenport schools? Well, we work on it hard. We market. Mm -hmm. We have a district of distinction model, which we have um, three different things like our um, Creative Arts Academy and our dual graduation at North High. We have vocational academies at West High School. So keeping the dropout rate low is, is another way. One of the, our increases from last year, we lost 300 students more um, was partially from dropouts. So we do, we work very, very hard to keep the kids in school. Plus we had a lot of families that actually moved out of Davenport. So working with the city, trying to find out what's going on 
and what can we do to stem that? Is the dropout rate, it's always kind of uh, impacted by the economy. Does the economy getting better help the dropout rate or make it worse? I mean, are people trying to get into the uh, uh, work market quicker or are they, you know, families are more stable so the kids stay in school? I haven't noticed a correlation. Interesting to look at, but I haven't yeah. noticed that. I mean, we've cut the dropout rate in half in the last four years. That's good. Graduation rate continues to go up. But when we're losing over 100 students in any given year, that's a lot of humans mm -hmm. and families that are impacting the community. So I take even one dropout as being serious. Davenport schools have done a lot to also decrease the truancy rate as well. I mean, you've had some successful campaigns in that area as well. Well, suspension rate is what we did. Um, we cut our suspension rate by 30 percent from last year, and we did that by putting what we call diversion teachers in the classroom. I paid for that by the extra $175 per student I took out of my reserve fund illegally. The theory being, if you can get the kids to still go in the building and still go to school, they won't be a detriment to society down the line. True. And you've seen that being successful, although it's, it's a relatively, I shouldn't say a relatively new program, but I mean, it's, it's hard to really fully estimate how well it's done. Well, we so had far. one year, and, and a drop of 30% in suspensions to me is excellent because now they stay in school, they're learning, and they're not out on the streets, and they realize even if they do something wrong, hey, I'm not going to go home and watch TV, I'm going to still be in the school. So uh, that, I think, helps with our behavior. One other success story I know that you want to talk about is that you talk about West High School and North High School and Central High School, but there is a fourth high school that a lot of people don't know about that's really becoming a name for itself. Our Mid-City High School, absolutely. It's like a community college. It's a beautiful facility. It's one that the students uh, respect and it shows respect for them. The students in there are mavericks. And it really is just an alternative way to learn. Our class sizes are smaller, and we have a lot of, of um, opportunities for them to catch up with their classes if they've missed some of their class. They can do that online. So it is a great success story, and we're very, very proud of it. It's also interesting because it has a, has a wide spectrum of students there. Oh, absolutely. Um, which, which is kind of... I don't know, encouraging, I would think, for, for, for the educators that are involved as well, because you've got, uh, you've got kids that might otherwise slip through the cracks. Well, we have some that need to catch up. Mm -hmm. We have others that graduate early. And being in a That's typical exactly building, they just can't, go, they can't fly as fast as they want to. We have um, both mothers and fathers there, and their children are in the same building uh, being kept in nursery. So it's a, it's a full service, community service school, and we want to try to meet the needs. One last thing involving uh, state government, and that has to do with the changes in collective bargaining. Uh, Damport School is pretty much getting its uh, teacher's contracts done before yes, we the did. collective bargaining changes occurred. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's a sigh of relief in a lot of ways. How do you think collective bargaining is going to affect Damport schools in the years to come, or is that just too early to tell? Well, we've got a contract that goes out to uh, 2020, so we're, we're good to, to look at that. And uh, we'll have to see what happens after that. But it affects more than just teacher contracts, does it, it not? It did. It's all, it's all contracts. Okay. Yes. And we, we have five different unions which, that we're uh, negotiating with, and we've settled with all of them. All of them are settled. Mm -hmm. Was the change in collective bargaining one of the impetuses to try to get the, uh, these contracts done? You bet. Yeah, absolutely. On both sides. <laughs> one last thing is J.B. Young. Uh, the facility is being changed in ways to make it more of a community center. I know you're real proud of transitioning an older school and a fear from neighbors that the school board was just going to walk away from that building. Um, and, and you're trying to prove them wrong. You're trying to say, no, we, we understand our role in the community. Well, you hate to close the school down. Right. But I, the entire time I talked about that we'd move the students out, I said it will become a community center. So the entire first floor, which includes a gymnasium, uh, multiple classrooms, a cafeteria, a full kitchen, is going to be turned into a community center. I call it the J.B. Young Opportunity Center. We're going to have 14 entities in there, including a boys and girls club. We'll have our Pro Start, which is our Culinary Institute. They'll be in there doing cooking. We're going to have a preschool. There's going to be a lot going on, and it's to service that neighborhood. It is a tough, I would think, to be so innovative when we're always talking about money and cuts. How is it possible that you can have it both ways? You've got to set priorities, one. Two, we get different pots of money from the state. I get $15 million a year to maintain our buildings. I can't use that for teachers. I can't use it for operations. I can't use it for programs. So that's the money that we use to do these things, like the pool and the auditorium at Central High School. Mm -hmm. Which is beautiful as well. I know you want to talk about that. Much of the pool is open. We're still waiting for the auditorium. Auditorium now looks like it's going to be May. A pool is, is being used right mm -hmm. now, and it's beautiful. All right, Dr. Dartate, thanks so much for joining us. We'll be keeping in touch with you throughout the year. 
Good luck. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. In a moment, celebrating vibrant neighborhoods in the cities. But first, celebrating the events you can still enjoy in the month of February in our area. Here's Laura Adams, Out and About. This is Out and About for February 20th through 26th. Hi, I'm Laura Adams. Join the Forest Grove Trivia Night Auction and Fundraiser at the Golden Leaf Banquet Center in Davenport on February 25th to help support the renovations to the one-room school. Or check out the first annual Mardi Gras at the Mansion Fundraiser for the Hallberg Center on the 25th. The culture they carried, Women Immigrants of Iowa, is now open at the German American Heritage Center. And the Establishment Theater presents an improvisational drinking, singing, crying, laughing, interactive Irish wake on the 24th. The vibrant colors and vigorous rhythms of Latin American music come to life in Music at the Butterworth Center, a performance featuring Quinteto Latino, a concert for local homeschool students. Trinity Episcopal Cathedral in Davenport hosts a free hymn festival celebration concert in collaboration with other Hilltop Church Chorus and the Quad City Wind Ensemble presents South of the Border, a program consisting of pieces written in a Latin American style presented at the Galvin Fine Arts Center on the 26th. Circa 21 continues its run of the musical Ghost at the Downtown Rock Island Theater, and Davenport Junior Theater presents fun for the whole family as they perform Ramona Quimby through the 26th. Plus, the Quad City Theater Workshop is accepting resumes from actors and designers for their upcoming production of Peter and the Starcatcher. Deadline to submit, February 24th. For more information, visit WQPT.org. Thank you, Laura. Alan Sweet is a Quad City musician, part of the band The Candy Makers. He's also a frequent guest to the River Music Experience stage, and we caught up with him one afternoon at the RME Community Stage as he played for us his song, Good Love and Energy. Here's an old song I wrote a long time ago called Good Love and Energy. It goes like this. Hold on to me, baby, as tight as you can. I'm gonna send you all the energy I've stored up from my hands into your hands. Don't take it off from me now. I'll be left with nothing, no. Nothing but the memories Please send some of it back to me Some of that good old loving energy back to me Throw away my aggressive tones I'll pick them up on my way out the door I said I'm sorry I don't want to speak to you like that no more. No, no, only sweet good loving tones coming straight from my soul. Please send some of it back to me, some of that good old loving energy back to me. Now don't. alone I can't stand it when you're across the room baby I need to feel your caress ya. give every little thing that I got just as long as you send some of that good loving right back to me some of that good old loving that good old loving baby Good old loving energy back to me. Hold on to me, babe, as tight as you can. I'm gonna send you all the energy. I've stored up from my hands, gonna put it into your hands. Don't take it off from me now. I'll be left with nothing, no. Nothing but the memories. Please send some of it back to me. Some of that good old loving. That good old loving, baby. That good old loving. 
energy back to me Alan Sweet with Good Love and Energy. His band, The Candy Makers, returns to the River Music Experience stage next month. They're scheduled to perform in the Redstone Room Friday, March 10th. WQPT is launching an 18-month initiative that takes a closer look at the neighborhoods that make up the cities. We see it time and time again, neighborhoods rebuilding. Some have hit hard economic times, others have simply grown old. Some have seen families leave the area where others are starting to thrive. Tar Macias from Ola America, coordinator of the Vibrant Neighborhoods Initiative, joins us right now. How are you doing, young man? Oh, very good, Jim. Thank you. Explain to me this initiative. It, it, it's with Ola America as well as WQPT. Correct. And it's through a grant through uh, global communities. And what we're doing for 18 months, we're going to be uh, taking a look at the um, flourishing neighborhood. And there's two big aspects of this project. The number one aspect is doing a series of community screenings where we're going to bring the community in. We'll watch a program from WQPT uh, that has to do with some of the issues going on uh, on the neighborhood. And then we have a discussion, you know, against the people watching, watching the, the, the film and in order to try to find out what, is the, what are the needs for the community or what is that we need to do to, to, in order to get a little more engaged as a community for everyone. For Flor Sante, which is a part of Moline, for those people that don't know, it's, it's, a, it's become a predominantly Hispanic area, which it hadn't been traditionally, but it was known as an area for immigrants since Correct. the very beginning of Moline. Actually, I, I think the, the tagline that we're going to be using is, is the gateway to the new Americans. Because for the last 150 years plus, you know, it's been the, the gateway for, for the new immigrants that come to the Quad Cities to work. Be it the Swedish immigrants, the Belgian immigrants, Greek, Mexicans, all of them, you know, were part of the Floresiente at one point. And before the Floresiente was called the Western of Moline. So, so it's been around for, for ever since uh, uh, John Deere decided to, to right. put the, the, the plant. The, right in, in that area. Right in that area. And then the railroad decided to have a spot here. That, that's been the driver, to, the two big drivers to bring I immigrants from all over the world to the Quad Cities. A lot of times when it comes to a neighborhood, Florciante being no different than any others, is that people think they already have analyzed it. They've already pigeonholed what that neighborhood is and perhaps even what it will be. Is that one of the things that you hope to do is to take a look and maybe knock down some of the stereotypes for some of these neighborhoods, Florciante to start with? Correct. Florciante is a neighborhood that Many of us drive by it every day. Right. Thousands of people drive by it. But very few take the moment to, to look around, to stop by, to really be, be part of, the, of, the, of that community. And, and if they took the moment just to realize what the Floresiente was about, they, they will see that we have a jewel here in, 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 the, in the Quad Cities that's very rich in, in culture in that aspect. And, uh, and, a, and a lot of times, uh, and we do that for all the neighborhoods in the Quad Cities, we have misconceptions. So we always have this conception of this neighborhood is that, the right. neighborhood is that. When in reality, we took the time to know the neighborhood, we realized that it's much more than that. So in the period of 18 months, you're going to be reaching into Florciente to get uh, input and information. How are you going to move outside? Because a lot of these stereotypes aren't necessarily inside the community. That's the second element that we have of this project, which th that encompasses creating a series of videos, 12 videos, that are going to be like a minute and a half, two minutes in length, that, that we're going to be featuring uh, the history of the Floresiente, the history of the West End of Moline. And we're going to be touching different subjects, but they're going to be focused on uh, the, the main uh, themes will be um, uh, immigration, religion, business. That's going to be key because actually business was the big, big driver for everybody to, to start building homes in the, in the West End of Moline. And, uh, and culture and education. That's going to be the, like, like a theme that we're trying to to put together because education uh, has a lot to do with, with that neighborhood. Be it that uh, uh, Ericsson, we were to talking about Ericsson School where we're going to be having the, the first screening is now the Esperanza Center. It closed down a couple of years ago, Ericsson School, so it, the, the Florentine neighborhood felt like it was ripping their heart out. That was the heart of the community. Right. So now Esperanza Center is the community center, brand new, and they're trying to be that. They're trying to be the place to go f uh, for uh, for the community. So uh, we're glad that they, are, they opened their doors for us in order to have the first screen in there. And we're hoping for people to, the people of Florida City to really engage with us and tell us what it is that 
that, that makes them think or what it is that, that they think uh, needs, we need to, done, to be done as a community. Well, let's talk about the screening because it is a movie called Skipping Up, which is interesting because it really deals more with children than anything else, does it not? I mean, we're kind of talking about making sure kids what, stay in school, stay vibrant, stay a big part of their community. And, and I think that's the education part of it. That's fantastic because we, we, we touch in that aspect. It's a 17 minute film out of a program in San Antonio, Texas. And what they did, they, they identified that the kids that, that stay behind one year or two, because maybe when they came to the area didn't speak English, so they set them back a year, that those kids, by the time they get to high school, 85% of them will drop out. So what they did, they created a program for the summer where they'll help them catch up for that grade. And if you help them catch up, the chances of them dropping out at of high school is only 5%. So you can see how it drops from 85 to 5%, and it's, it's uh, fantastic. That, that was such a successful program, then, and then a year after they created that, they got a $14 million grant from the federal government in order to expand it to more more. Can cities. you replicate this elsewhere? Do we, number one, do we need to replicate that here? Mm. And, and number two, if we want to, what steps do we need to take in order to make that happen? Yeah. You said 18-month program. What do you hope to accomplish in 18 months? I mean, when you, when you look back 18 months from now, how do you know this was a success? Perfect. One part of, of, the, of the screen is in, uh, this, this is an element that we're doing through email through our uh, subscribers to the newsletter for WQPT and the All America newsletter subscribers, we're gonna be having a survey created by Western Illinois University. And that survey, then we're gonna have it at the end of the 18 month period. And we're gonna see if there was, there was any change in the perception or the present neighborhood. Mm -hmm. and, and this survey is gonna be sent to, to the whole community. You know? So if anybody really wants to participate on that survey, please go to our website, uh, WQPT uh, uh, in uh, .org, and you will find a link for that. Yeah. And then perhaps other communities, other neighborhoods might see the same kind of attention? I think the long-term goal for this is to, to start celebrating the neighborhoods that make up the Quad Cities. Uh, one, I've been living here in the area for almost 30 years. And one thing I hear every 10 years or so, people want to create the super cities. They want to create everything to one banner. And, and you know, once you think about it, it's like, well, okay, what about the, 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 the neighborhoods that are here? Are, are, their identity is key to us. If you try to, to put a blanket identity to all of us, then you know that, that, that might be a little unfair to, to right. a, a, lot of, a lot of the neighborhoods. Celebrate some of the changes, some of the differences, and yeah. some of the things that make neighborhoods great. And a good comparison is Chicago. They say how, how the neighborhoods are very well defined in Chicago, mm -hmm. and that's what makes Chicago so, so unique. Yeah. So if we're, if we're able to celebrate our differences in the neighborhoods, maybe that will make us so unique. Tarmacy is from Ola America, as well as part of this new Vibrant Neighborhoods Initiative. Thanks so much for joining Thank us. You. Once again, the first Vibrant Neighborhoods Initiative discussion will be held Saturday morning, February 25th, starting at 11 in the morning. We'll be screening the documentary Skipping Up, featuring eighth graders who took part in that successful dropout prevention project. It's being held at the Esperanza Center on Moline's Fifth Avenue in the Florcienta neighborhood. Also, a reminder of a WQPT event that's an annual celebration for families in the cities. WQPT's Imagination Station is coming up next month. We're giving away free tickets starting March 1st. You'll get a chance to win tickets at our website. Check out the details at WQPT.org. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device. Thanks for taking time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Public Affairs Programming on WQPT is brought to you by The Singh Group at Merrill Lynch. Serving the wealth management needs of clients in the region for over 25 years.